over the last couple of years, I think people forget that Birmingham's the second city because there's so much developed in cities like Manchester, Liverpool, even as far as Leeds, that people forget that Birmingham is actually the second city and that there are things going on. But it's because so much more is invested in these other cities, I feel, that, yeah, we get forgotten about. Mm, right. Yeah, I don't care to be Birmingham's, yeah. I, I love living here. I haven't lived anywhere else but Birmingham and I wouldn't go anywhere. Yeah, I'm proud to be from me. Because I think we have a voice and a lot of people in Birmingham, they like to use their voice as well. Um, but it just doesn't get heard by the powers that be. The country's all London, 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 and everywhere else, and everybody seems to... I think London think? just focuses a lot on London. Yeah. 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 It's, it's all based on an area, like, different projects, they're all, they're all set up around London, but they don't really go anywhere else. I don't think anywhere outside London is thought of. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think they listen to anybody. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Frank Lawton, and I too am proud to be from Birmingham. I'm also proud to be the director of the hearings and your chair for this evening. Now, this debate has come about because of a feeling, a feeling that Birmingham's voice is not being heard. It began with a series of conversations across the city where we spoke to people and asked them what they felt about Birmingham. What, was, what were its successes, the things that it could improve on, its character. And as you'd expect, we got a whole array of different responses. But two things, two things came through very strongly. The first was that regardless of what people thought about the city, people were very proud to be from Birmingham. And attendant to that pride was a disappointment, a frustration, born from a near unanimous sense of not being heard, not only nationally, but often within their own city. That's what Hearing Birmingham, a debate on the city's future, seeks to address. Now, we all know that power is centralized in London and as a capital, that's to a degree inevitable. But that does not mean that there cannot be a vital public sphere elsewhere. For when you think that your voice isn't being heard, when you think that decisions are made elsewhere, when you think the future is something that happens to you, rather than something that you make happen, then the public sphere can shrink further and with it risk exacerbating that estrangement, that frustration that is felt in the first place. So this debate asks what we as a city want to do and what we as citizens can do to help shape Birmingham's future. Now, I don't expect that everyone here will agree on what the issues are, let alone the solutions, but that is not really the point. Tonight, together, we will attempt to provide a new public model of a public sphere that is entertaining, respectful, and forward-looking. We want to make ourselves heard as a city. That starts by hearing each other as citizens. Now, this is a new format. It's new for you, it's also new for me. This is the first of a series of events that we hope to be hosting in Birmingham. So I think a little bit first on, on how the kind of format of tonight will proceed. Hopefully it'll be a little more entertaining than your average council committee hearing. And here goes. We have four fantastic speakers who know the city back to front. Each speaker will offer a proposal on an issue that they think the city needs to address going forward. They have seven minutes in which to do this. They will then be grilled by our local in-house barrister, Afshan Henna, who will dig into the detail of the proposal for a further seven minutes. Now, no panel can ever be fully representative of a city's stories and voices, its successes and its concerns. And ladies and gentlemen, that is where you come in. This debate will then be opened up and you will have your chance to ask questions of our speakers, comment on the issue at hand and offer stories or evidence from your own lives in the city. And together, we can start to tell a story of Birmingham, a story that is being filmed, broadcast online, and will be taken into local schools in the weeks following the event. And finally, rather than just wandering off into the night as this debate ends, I'd like to invite you all to our refreshments reception, where you can meet a selection of various local groups and charities that are helping to shape a better Birmingham, and so you can act upon what you've heard 
here this evening. But I think enough, enough from me. It's time to introduce you to our speakers. Can you please give a warm welcome to the former head of King Edward School and Sully Hell School, John Clawton? <laughs> the, the, the founder of Adara, a women's, women's support network for the West Midlands, and presenter of a BBC documentary about Birmingham, Aisha Rickball. The man in charge of planning and transport policy for Birmingham City Council throughout the 80s and most of the 90s, Alan Wenban Smith. <laughs> and the director of the non partisan think tank British Future and a former general secretary of the Fabian Society, Sunda Katwala. <laughs> and also a hand for our inquisitor for the night, Birmingham barrister Afshan Henna. So just before we start tonight, I'd like to take a kind of quick straw poll, which we'll kind of take again at the end of the debate as a barometer, a vague barometer of public opinion. Tonight, we're going to hear proposals on four things. Education and its links to integration and employment. Planning and placemaking. Opportunities for women and young people. And a question about who Birmingham's identity is for. So that's education and its links to integration and employment, planning and placemaking, opportunities for women and young people, and who Birmingham's, who Birmingham's identity is for. So off the top of your head, which of these four issues strikes you instantly as, as the most that needs to be addressed of the four presented? So education and its links to integration and employment, just a show of hands. It's fairly, it's very popular. <laughs> planning and placemaking. Okay. Opportunities for women and young people. Okay. And who Birmingham's identity is for. Okay. So we've got a fairly, fairly even split with education just out in the lead, I would suggest. We'll see if that changes. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker. John Clawton was the head of Sully Hill School from 2001 to 2005 the Chief Master of King Edward's School from 2006 to 16. He's also very keen for me to remind you all that he won a John Players League medal, winner's medal, sorry, for Warwickshire in 1980. That was cricket, by the way. Um, I haven't got my medal with me, but um, I'd like to apologise, first of all, for looking so smart. Um, uh, as a retired headmaster, I've got quite a lot of suits, so I'm just trying to wear them out. Um, and I've only really got play clothes apart from this. Um, as Frank has said, um, I was for a time, the, uh, for a decade, until 18 months ago, the Chief Master of King Edward's School, Birmingham. Um, that's the school, the second oldest institution of this, of this city, the school of uh, Burne Jones, of Tolkien, um, of Enoch Powell, um, of two Nobel Prize winners, of Lee Child, the creator of Jack Reacher, and also Andy Street, the mayor. Um, in terms of education, I'm also a governor of Selly Oak Trust School, uh, which is attended by my autistic son, Sam, uh, to whom we turn later. Um, it has no famous alumni yet. Um, since I'm no longer a chief master, I spend some of my time walking around that wonderful jewel that is Rotten Park Reservoir, and I meet one or two of the audience uh, on my, as I Google walk around. Recently, a couple of weeks ago, they put up some no fishing signs. Um, these signs were written in six languages, uh, English, of course, Polish, Slovenian, Bulgarian, Romanian, and Lithuanian. I only know that because Sammy, my autistic son, could recognize all of the flags. Um, I also go sometimes, uh, as a hypochondriac, uh, to the Caris Medical Center, which is about 300 yards away from Rotten Park Reservoir, just by Perrot's Folly, one of Tolkien's Twin Towers. There, you can sign in for an appointment in 18 different languages, although not all of the six languages visible on the reservoir are amongst the 18. I must admit, I don't entirely understand Birmingham in 2018, but I do love it. Its diversity, its complexity, and its capacity to change. I have seen that change in my lifetime. I came to Birmingham at the age of 12, 12 as a migrant, well, from Yorkshire anyway where my family had lived since the Vikings, or so it seemed. 
as if I was educated at Cambridge School as well as being the head there. And when I was a boy there, it was the best, the very best academic school in the country. Indeed, in the early 1970s, King Edward School Birmingham may have been the only thing in Birmingham that actually did work. It was full of very bright boys from all sorts of backgrounds. So it was diverse, but it wasn't entirely diverse um, because out of 700 boys at the time, there were only three or four who weren't white. When I returned from my wanderings to Middle Earth in 20, 2006, it didn't have three or four non-white boys, it had 400 out of 800. By now, it's 500 out of 800 and rising still. However, in the second decade of the 21st century, it is still trying to do what it was doing 40 years ago, change aspirations and lives through education. And in 2016 and 2018, it was still succeeding with a wonderfully diverse and integrated community. So I want to talk about education, and I have three reasons, three concerns, and five suggestions. You can do with that what you like with all 11 of them. So my three reasons, why? Well, my first reason to talk about education is because that's what I know best. After all, I even have a son who's here this evening who is doing his teaching practice at Bordley, Borsley Green Girls School. My second reason is that it is a subject too little talked about, except when things go dreadfully wrong. That gets me really cross. In recent years, I've been to several great business events which have gone on and late into the night, but no matter how late they go into the, light, into the night, no one, or hardly anyone, mentions the word education. They talk about skills, but education they don't talk about. And yet, every single employer of every single employee depends upon the education that the employee has received. It seems odd to me that employability and skills should fall under the, under the remit of the new mayor, but not education. My third reason is that education could be the thing that will matter most in this city in the next generation. After all, we're always told that Birmingham is the youngest city in Europe, and education is always presented as the most potent force for change in any society. If this city is to be successful, and its citizens are to enjoy that success, we will need to grow a sense of integration and common purpose, not end up with a city of silos and ghettos and introverted communities. We'll also need to ensure that all elements of that wide community are beneficiaries of the city's success, not just a few. Education is the force that is most likely to make this happen. So those are my reasons why education is being talked about. My three concerns. My first concern is about integration, or the lack of it. Birmingham is a city where some schools have 97% of their pupils for whom English is an additional language. That's quite remarkable. But on the other hand, it also has 70 schools where fewer than 10% of pupils are in the same situation. You have very, very white schools and very, very non-white schools. Too often schools are not a force for integration, but for separation. Of course, you can't do much about this. Much of it is to do with geography and demographics rather than human agency. But I do worry that the proliferation of faith schools, of free schools, of new faith-based independent schools, and homeschooling cannot be serving the cause of greater integration and mutual understanding. My second concern is about what we teach our children and how. Schools and teachers are, taught, are caught in the jaws of national demand from Ofsted and SATs, measurement and accountability, and many of you will have had children who face that all the time. You may not know what Progress 8 is, but it dominates, indeed ruins, the lives of those who work in schools. Heads and teachers cannot lead, innovate, or create a broad curriculum, nor can they set their teachers free to answer the needs of particular students in particular schools. The dead hand of the DFE put, pays, puts paid to that. My third concern is about schools and the world of work. There have been, over the decades, many, many initiatives in this area, but none have really worked. There really is not enough worthwhile collaboration between the life of school and the world beyond. It's stating the bleeding obvious, but the work, a week's work experience just isn't getting that job done. And so, quickly, my five suggestions, and you may have others, and these are only suggestions. My first suggestion is about people, teachers and head teachers. 
I happen to think that being a teacher is the best job there is in the world. It's certainly better than being a head teacher, but even that's one of the best jobs there is. I'd love to live in a country, to live in a city, where all communities understood and celebrated the joy and value of being a teacher. They are the most important people in any city. It is not what you do if you can't do anything else. My second suggestion is about curriculum. It is not easy to break the chains forged by the DfE, but is it really beyond our capacity to teach some things that build on the nature of Birmingham and its children? This city is full of bilingual, even trilingual children. It's a miracle. But why is this seen as a problem rather than an opportunity? In a world that is short of linguists, that is desperate for linguists and communication, why aren't the university language departments awash with Birmingham kids who already have two or three languages? My third suggestion is about collaboration between schools. On Tuesday, Oxford University was being assaulted, not for the first time, and rightly, I believe, for the whiteness and the suddenness and the middle-classness of its undergraduates. In Birmingham, we do have schools that are very successful in Oxford applications. King Edward's obviously being one of them. It must be possible for those schools to share their wisdom and thereby enable more bright Birmingham students to go to the very best universities. My fourth suggestion is about work. Schools and businesses can build more genuine long-term relationships so that children are leaving school with the skills, the human qualities and the ambition that the world needs. And for a start, why couldn't every business of a certain size undertake to provide a school governor for a school? My fifth suggestion is entirely personal and comes back to my autistic son, Sam. He's 17, and when you have an autistic young adult, you worry that the unemployment rate for autistic adults is 85%. Perhaps Birmingham, with all its diversity and need for integration, could become a national leader in employing those with special needs. That, too, is part of creating a city that is good for everyone. Thank you. I'm going to knock at six minutes in this process so that you know whereabouts we are in the process. Thank you. Frank. Did you do that? In the I didn't do that with you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be nervous, John. <laughs> uh, he always scares me, Frank. Um, I just want to go to the heart of what you were saying, and what stood out was integration in education. And I'm sure we've all had experience of that. Why? Why do you think integration is important for our future? My problem is my experience is quite limited because I spent so much time in, in a decade in one school. But we were very fortunate, and there's some teachers here who could speak up about it. At King Edwards, we were very fortunate because pupils did come from all over the city. And one of the problems that I describe is the fact that um, when schools are local schools, they are bound to reflect um, the nature of their communities, and they can be very um, one-dimensional. I think the value of integration is, um, in a school like that, it does enable young people not only to relate to their peers whose backgrounds and, and beliefs, et cetera, they understand, but also to rehearse their arguments with other people in the informality of being young. And I think there are even some boys here this evening who are King Edward's boys who benefited from that opportunity. As a teacher teaching theory of knowledge for the International Baccalaureate, get that plug in, to be in a room talking about why you would trust anything or believe in anything and what you would trust of the things that you had read in a, in a, in a class which has got Muslims and Sikhs and Indians and Chinese and Koreans as well as English boys or British boys from many different backgrounds, that is a truly exhilarating experience, and I think that's really valuable. I'm not asking them all to become the same. I'm talking about integration, not assimilation, but I think that's really precious. What's interesting there, John, is you've mentioned, obviously, different uh, races, different ethnicities mixing, but integration is not also class as well. And in terms of your background, you were in a very privileged setting where everyone may have been diverse, but they were from a certain class? Or uh, how wrong can you be? 
because um, about 30% of the boys at King Edward School are on assisted places uh, paying very little. There were more kids on free school meals at King Edward School Birmingham than in the grammar schools, and that was one of the things that was most precious to what we were doing. I'm grateful to be able to chance to correct that, to shoot down that myth. But I quite agree that um, my point about, and I do know, when you look at all these towers being built, etc., the question you're asking about can we ensure that prosperity that is built in the middle is genuinely shared across the different communities is a really, really important question. And if, whether it be class or be it income, it doesn't really matter, if certain people feel that some are benefiting and others are not, that will be very detrimental over, over time. Thank you, John. And in terms of results of some of these schools that may not appear integrated, if they're achieving uh, you know, really good pass rates, why, why try and mix it up and integrate schools more? Because there is more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in the philosophy of good results. And, the heads I, and I've spoken to a couple of heads whom I've known quite well who have run outstanding inner city secondary schools, and they would say that the most important thing, that in a sense, of course your children need good results. That is a necessary condition of a successful school, but it may not be sufficient because the issues of values and morality and those kind of things are just as important for educating your young as them getting appropriate GCSE results. That's, that's all very well, but in terms of you've mentioned employability, if you're not reaching those results, and you've talked about this as well, having that uh, experience uh, of, of the workplace in, in education, then surely the most important thing is, is hitting that so that our young people are getting the jobs and can show that they've got the qualifications. Well, I say, as I say, I think that you're quite right that getting those qualifications has become an absolute necessity. But on the other hand, when you look at the world of work, um, and there are people who know this better than I because I've spent my life in teaching, all the time, what people, employers are talking about is that, in a sense, having those basic qualifications are necessary, but they are also looking for many other important qualities, such as teamwork, such as powers to collaborate, such as problem solving, just what they would, what they would describe as soft skills. And to that extent, your schools being able to provide those other things in addition to that basic academic success is really, really important. And John, you also mentioned having uh, approaching businesses, um, say, to become uh, governors, yep. one person becomes a governor. Whose responsibility is it to try and set that up and bring that to the forefront? Well, I must admit, I mean, over the years, I have had some conversation with people like uh, the Chamber of Commerce, etc. It seems to me that there's no reason at all where, why those inst the institutions, whether it be th individually through the Chamber of Commerce or be it through the um, large companies coming here, it seems to me that um, it's not difficult to make those connections. But maybe it's best done by, the, by a central, central organisation in terms of employment. And of course, one of the problems for Birmingham schools is that, in a sense, they have become much more disparate with the um, disappearance to all intents and purposes of the local authority. So, and I know there's the Birmingham Education Partnership and so on. It's not always easy, but I, I, I sh surely think it is possible to have worthwhile uh, conversations, whether with institutions like the Chamber or whether with individual businesses. John, forgive me, aren't we kind of um, mollycoddling our young? Isn't it part of life to finish our education and discover for ourselves where we're meant to go, what work life is, what's expected of us. Isn't that a life skill that we should attain rather than it being taught but to us? Where are they going to get it from unless they get experience? How do you choose when, you're, when you've got given no means to choose? I don't think we're mollycoddling our young. I think our young, I hope the teachers in this room would agree with me, I think our young have a harder time than any, any, any children have ever had. Perhaps they need a bit of mollycoddling and some guidance as to what kind of careers there are and what, uh, what, what are the possibilities. Thank you, John. And in terms of, you've mentioned also, you're not a big fan of faith schools, free schools, homeschooling. Um, isn't that an expression of Birmingham taking control and setting their own direction of how they want their young people educated? It may be certain, com certain schools or certain communities making that decision. Whether that is, and you can understand that they may have their reasons, whether that is good for the future, of Birmingham is a different matter. And um, lastly, what type of school would you like to see in Birmingham? What's your ideal? It's a bit late for that. I, you know, I'm, <laughs> I've, I've done my bit. Um, I think, to be honest, I, I, what I would like to see is, and I think it's very difficult, but I would like to see 
schools whereby um, strong leaders who are deeply committed to some fundamental values about what education should be like, I'd like them to have the autonomy to actually take their schools where they want them to go, understanding the responsibility they owe to their pupils, but also to the community in which they work. Thank you. Thank you, John. Is that it? Can I do that? So you've heard from John, and as promised, opening up to the audience, what do you think? You've heard that John says that we need a greater focus upon education in the city, to improve standards, to improve integration, to improve employability. I mean, we've all either been students or many of us, presumably, we've all been at school, right? Exactly. Um, what do you think? If you just put, raise your hand, we have two people on hand to provide some microphones. You can be heard. Gentlemen. At the back. Yes. Hello. Thanks. Um, so, uh, just on, on that last point, um, the idea of uh, the schools we want to see in Birmingham would be sort of independent schools driven by strong leaders. Um, I'm just wondering, doesn't that sound a little bit like academies or free schools? And moreover, if, um, as happens in the order of things, these strong leaders come from particular communities, might these strong leaders not wish to shape their schools with particular, say, religious uh, or other sort of belief systems and sets of values, which might mean that they could be faith schools. So I'm just wondering whether the sort of aspiration for a school just outlined at the um, end of your remarks, John, might not be in tension with some of the things you were saying earlier. You're welcome to. Yeah. <coughs> as ever, as ever, a very acute question. I'm also, um, no, I quite agree. The danger is um, if you uh, trust the strong leader to uh, only to their own ideas, I'm I've come to this idea because as part of this process, because I, in a sense I, I do only know a small part of things, I have been, I've spoken um, at, at some length with two heads of uh, outstanding inner city secondary schools, um, both of whom have retired in the last year, 18 months. Um, and um, what I respected most about them was... First of all, they had a longevity. They were not, in a sense, super leaders parachuted in to sort something else, but each one of them had been head of their school for 15 years. Um, each one of them um, uh, had a really, really strong set of values which were about the role of their pupils in the community. They were not about their own, what they thought was the right thing, but trying to do, provide the best education for the children. They were, one of them was a school which was, in my ca categorization, would have been... 90% uh, not English as a, 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 as a first language, uh, and another would have been 70%. Um, but they themselves, I think, they had set themselves out with, to, to try to lay down a really core set of values. And one of them said, the one thing he had to do in the school was that when he arrived at the school, the pupils thought that they were, to use his phrase, ghetto kids in a ghetto school. And he felt it was his job, and it said it took him a decade, 15 years, it was his job to enable the pupils in that school to see beyond that characterization. I quite agree there are concerns, and you can't have absolute autonomy in that kind of a way. It does come down, I think, um, to the issue of what values, you are, you know, what values you are espousing and whether you're thinking about your own ideas or whether you're thinking what's right for the kids in the school. Take a pick. We'll go for the gentleman at the... Hi, I kind of want to come back a bit on the question that the gentleman back asked. And what he was describing, that's not a leader, that's a manager. Because the big distinction between a manager and a leader is a manager does things right. A leader does what's right. And what you were saying about the kids coming to school knowing that they're not ghetto kids coming to a ghetto school. And the second point on that is... Um, there's a charity called Inspiring the Future, and one of the things I'm setting up is trying to get governors into schools. I've tried to get into a number of schools as a governor through them. The biggest barrier I've found is, well, there's one particular school quite near me. I live in, a, I live in Sheldon, which is a largely white working class area. Um, there's a growing uh, Muslim population, um, which actually is a bit like coming because I used to live in Greet, which is right next to Spark Hill. <laughs> Um, and the thing I found is 
what their number one priority for who they wanted as governor was practice the same religion that they do, which wasn't that which was a form well, of Christianity. If I could very well. quickly, I mean, of course, that's one of the issues, and in a sense, ensuring that your governing body is not, in a sense, merely a narrow reflection of, of, your, of, your, of your leadership. I think it's, that's really, really interesting. And, of course, such governors may be a means whereby some of the concerns about schools becoming very introverted can be averted. In terms of your management and leadership, I suppose one of the, the two heads I was talking about, um, they would both say the problem about being a the head of a school these days is probably the way in which the world is designed, that it forces you to manage rather than to lead. And that, I think, is one of the great sadnesses for, um, for heads today, that they feel that all they are doing is ensuring that they are doing the right thing and, in a sense, meeting the demands of an external authority rather than being allowed to do what they believe in. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name's Lee, and congratulations for putting tonight on. Well done. Um, I, I hear two slight conflicts in what you've said. Um, you want school autonomy, but you also want to, them to follow the curriculum a bit more. So obviously, that's centrally set. So wh which would you prefer? Um, and the values, I, I agree that schools are... I'm a teacher in another life. Um, who sets the values at the school, and what happens when the values that the children come in with are not the same values that you set in the school? Uh, in terms of curriculum, um, uh, there will always be a tension, I think, in a sense there's, there's always going to be a, a core curriculum. To my mind, the, the, I suppose the issue is, is the extent to which um, government or whoever will allow a certain degree of flexibility and intelligence. At the moment, as far as I can see, um, the demands of certain subjects all the way from being little all the way through are driving out things which you and I by value it might be the teaching of languages in junior schools or it might be art, drama, music, etc. You, you could name subjects. Um, you could name subjects like that. All I'm saying is I think there clearly has to be a balance, but I think not allowing schools to enact a certain degree um, of freedom um, is, I think, really useful. Going back to your point, if I can link this together, um, clearly some of the most um, potentially difficult um, situations are where um, you can have two different situations where, in a sense, the, the leadership of a school and the governance of a school are, uh, and the pupil body are, in a sense, all aligned, but nevertheless, in a sense, as I say, the danger of that becoming an introvert, introverted community rather than a community that is, in a sense, trying to engage with the wider community of the city. Um, that is clearly... Um, that um, that's a t can be a problem in the same way when you have a great collision between values of a head or governance and the values of the parents and the pupils. That can be problematic. I would argue that that's why, going back to your point, that's why actually really striving to ensure that you have balanced governing bodies who are giving due scrutiny uh, and thinking about these wider issues is really, really important. And perhaps what I've learned is, I go back to your point, I think that quite often the quality of governance, which is probably under-thought about, could be, could be absolutely critical. And we have also, we have seen circumstances where, where bad governments, governance can be utterly disastrous. So we'll take two final questions and we'll sure. take them together. With the lady in the second row. Hello, going back to what you said earlier about skills, um, there's a big black hole in skills in um, Birmingham at the moment. That's why a lot of companies don't want to come here. Um, I'm, a, I'm a bit interested in, you know, the curriculum. You go out, you want, people to, you want people to stick to the curriculum. But don't you think in the age of automisation and people getting rid of the creative, creative industries, do you think the curriculum is really good? Do you think the problem is integration or do you think the problem is the curriculum in the education because the thing is I don't feel like people have the skills when they leave school because we don't do tech anymore we don't have the arts industry and really we need the arts and industry because we're in, we're in the age of startup age and we need to be able to have these children have the problem solving to create all these these skills so we can move on and compete with other countries like Brazil and India who are surpassing us so I would like to have your point of view on the curriculum which I think is outdated and can we just take a Hands a second point, we'll answer those in one. Or 
right, final question for this section. I think there's a, there's a bit of a problem about just focusing on schools. Education is lifelong and should be lifelong. And there's a real danger at the moment that all we're doing is producing people who are producer consumers. And, and the education system is falling for that line from central government, and we need to stand up for that and actually produce children and ad young adults who are fit for the purpose, for the modern life that they're going to, and the challenges they're going to face, in, and which we're going to leave for them to have to deal with. And if we don't do that, then the education system in schools is failing, and therefore it's where they are learning the skills they need out there on the street, from their home, and from their places of work and other places other than schools. Okay, so both of us are particularly in relation to how Birmingham, I suppose, would address that? Um, I agree entirely. I mean, I think one of the problems about the way in which curric the curriculum has gone, it has become, that, in a sense, assessment has become critical, and therefore the curriculum has been formed from, you've invented assessment first and then formed a curriculum. Um, you, I'm afraid you get a bit of a hobby horse, but clearly um, there are two big problems, perhaps beyond, beyond GCSE, even if you don't worry about that. The problem, those, those problems are that... Um, Narrow specialisation beyond 16 is a, is, um, isn't a great idea, and A-levels, which have now been marched back up to the top of the hill, um, are, are probably not the right answer for a, uh, a, a broad range of pupils. Also, the vocational um, academic divide has been an unhelpful schism in our education system for quite, for quite a long time. Um, and to that extent, um, you have to ask yourself the question whether, there, whether you, you could look with fresh eyes at uh, providing curriculum, a curriculum which is not like that, because in a sense it's largely created by what universities want. Um, I happen to be a great advocate of international baccalaureate, um, but of course I would say that, wouldn't I? But it's a broad education and also thinks very hard about preparing people for work with its new, one of its new programmes. Um, and I get, need, to get that ad, need to get that advert out. Going back to your point, in term, you're absolutely right that if all students are getting at the end of their education is to some degree like you know a certificate which is seen as a ticket to somewhere else if that is the sum total of the education we have provided from the age of 2 to 18 then we have failed them and thinking about these other skills and other abilities and the capacity to work with each other and the curiosity and things those things are absolutely vital now the next question is can Burma do anything about it I don't know I think, you know, at, least, at least in a sense, a city like this should have the strength to be advocating certain things which at least should be heard and answered. What happens thereafter? I'm too old, I like my suit. Okay. Thank you, John. Alan Wen Van Smith was in charge of planning policy for the City Council from 1981 to the mid-1990s. As well as planning, his responsibilities have included advising on economic strategy, urban regeneration, transport and housing, which gave him a ringside view to the events of, at a critical time in this city. He's also chaired Birmingham Health Authority um, and until last year was chairman of the Lunar Society, a Birmingham Civic Group. So, Alan. Okay, good evening. My, my big issue is about making a Birmingham a better place to live, and I do mean there physically. That's only the starting point, as you be clear. Placemaking is fundamental to jobs, to meeting housing needs, and to reducing the damage caused by traffic growth. Over the last 20 plus years, we've come to rely on market led property development for all those purposes. I believe this has damaged Birmingham as a place to live. Longer term, I think this is a serious threat to our future. I want to persuade you that that threat is real and also that we can do something about it in seven minutes. Um, so what have we learned in Birmingham about placemaking? When I came to Birmingham in 1981, the city was losing jobs faster than Scotland and Wales put together. But government policy was to avoid intervention and rely on market forces. So we had to work out our own salvation. Fortunately, in Dick Knowles, Birmingham had a le leader who was equal to the task. He led the city back from the brink of collapse. In the early years, the recovery was supported by the inner city partnership, which brought together all the council departments with the local office of the Department of Trade and Industry. Although it only had modest funds, about 25 million a year, this gave the city council a strong focus on local communities and local businesses. 
As an aside, just worth mentioning, the inner city partnership started life in the 1970s as a home office pro program at a time when the home office was a beacon of enlightened social policy, <laughs> which, which shows how things can change, hopefully can change back again as well. So what's gone wrong? By the 1990s, placemaking, then known as urban regeneration, became increasingly property dominated nationally as well as locally. This shifted the cost from public to private purse, but the un unintended side effect was to lose the social perspective. Economic development in particular has become synonymous with property development. In Birmingham, as elsewhere, the community focus of the inner city partnership has become weaker. Schemes like the current Paradise Circus and Centenary Square developments, by contrast, seem oversized, impersonal, and lacking in an attractive public space. And Birmingham's council's big city plan seems to envisage more of the same spreading right out to the ring road. Supporters claim that property development creates jobs. But in my view, the lesson of the 1980s is that the economic future of Birmingham depends on its human capital, and we've heard something about that. A strong social fabric and quality environment contribute to a lifestyle that attracts and retains talent. Without that, property development merely shifts the pieces of the jigsaw around. Worthwhile commercial development is a consequence of successful placemaking, not its motor. So what can we do about it? We can't control what happens at a national or global scale, but we ought to take back control, I've coined a phrase, of what does lie within our power. In particular, how decisions are made and who makes them as governance, how information is generated and shared, the expert opinion, how citizens make their voices heard, and that's what I want to focus on, participation. Two examples, one bad and one good, illustrate what I mean. Both are from my experience of transport planning in Birmingham. Both are from a while back, but placemaking is a long-term project and the principles do not change. The bad example relate, relates back to the mid-1980s when two major transport schemes for access to Birmingham city centre were on the agenda, one rail and one road. A light rail scheme from Castle Bromwich and a tunnel under Kings Heath to link to the M40. In both cases, Major economic benefits were forecast by the experts, particularly for the inner city, and in both cases, major public consultations were launched to consider the proposals. However, while the public were consulted, it was only after the schemes had been planned. The impacts were direct and obvious, but the benefits were diffuse and depended on trusting expert opinion. In both cases, the public opposition was so fierce, the schemes had to be dropped. A good example, in the early 1990s, the M40 issue flared up again when road proposals for South Birmingham were again consulted on. And even though these were more modest, they were, also, they, they were once again uh, a, a cause of controversy. This time, the City Council sent the proposals back to the drawing board. They decided there must be more involvement of communities before solutions are proposed. A small focus group was assembled to do this, consisting of three councillors, three city officers, and six community interest group representatives. As the leader of the South Birmingham study, I was given 12 months to come up with an answer. We decided our first task was to overcome our own democratic deficit by researching public opinion. We designed a survey that would be representative of the whole area. It would focus on people's perception of problems, their aspirations for the future, and the trade-offs they would support between these. In other words, it would tap public expertise about values. And this guided the technical transport work, leading to a new balance between the local and through roles of major roads, traffic calming to reduce traffic road speeds while maintaining capacity, and abolition of most of the historic road protection lines that covered Birmingham. Though through genuine public participation, the South Birmingham study achieved a high level of public acceptance. At a technical level, it won national road funding, a first for slowing traffic down, um, as well as national planning accommodation, the first for a road scheme of any kind. The lasting legacies included removal of blight, allowing lo local shopping centres on major roads to develop, 
and a radical reduction in pedestrian accidents, particularly to children, as I discovered later when I became chairman of the Health Authority, and we didn't get any money because we weren't killing enough kids. Um, the lesson is that public participation is crucial to placemaking. In the age of internet debt bubbles, it's more important than ever that participation is genuine and representative. So I'd ask you to vote for placemaking and participation. Thank you. Within seven minutes. Thank you, Alan. Um, you mentioned attractive public spaces in Birmingham city centre and lifestyle. Isn't that more of a personal choice? A lot of us might think that Birmingham city centre's got quite a number of attractive places for us to sit down, have our lunch. Yeah, it's interesting you should say that because that is something that has changed radically in the, in the 35 years I've been here. I remember when I was first here, an American visitor said to me, um, I really like Birmingham. He said, looking around the place, I wouldn't mind living here, but I'd hate to be a visitor. And, you know, that actually was the very much perception then. Now, we've put all the effort into redoing the city centre and we've made it very nice for visitors but we haven't achieved the same in terms of the people living here, I don't believe. So you'd say, what would be an attractive lifestyle then for people living here? Well, I think the main thing is to do with what I call the social fabric. It's, it's the idea that uh, we, are, we share enough communal values and we interact enough to create a place which people are comfortable in from a very wide range of backgrounds and skills and incomes and all the rest, if we can do that, uh, that creates a, 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 an environment that people want to live in socially. So how are we to open at Birmingham to make the space more inclusive for everybody? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a long-term process. I mean, I, I, I think what I've learned, and, and being involved in the inner city partnership was crucial to this, is that there are surprising resources and surprising relationships that can be developed if you're prepared to spend time and go into them. I, one of the th jobs I did when I was working for City Council was to set up a housing action trust in Castle Vale. Now, Castle Vale was regarded as the dregs, a kind of a poor white estate that nobody would go in near. It, it, having done the work and uh, done the uh, public involvement of the people on the estate to understand what the world looked like from their view, we actually developed a, a way of dealing with that that was successful and I think has changed Castle Vale. You can't, you know, th this is not something which is a minor task. If you're going to do that kind of thing across a wide range of different locations, different communities uh, in, in the city, it's going to take time, it's going to take money, it's going to take focus, that's got to be a priority. In terms of, you've mentioned um, public opinion, you've just given another example of Castle Vale. Um, isn't it certain sectors of the community that can participate in that? Say people who are retired have got more time. If you're working, say, over 40 hours, you're not wanting mm. to, to give your opinion. So, again, aren't you just getting a certain sector's opinion on, on, major, um, on major things happening in your city? No, I understand what you're saying. The critical thing here, I should have perhaps emphasised, is that you do representative opinion research so that alongside the sort of self-generated reactions that you quite rightly draw on attention to would tend to be very much people strongly of a, of a view because they are directly offended and have got time and space and motivation to do something about it. If you don't balance that with serious, in-depth, face-to-face uh, opinion research, looking at what people in general have as, 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 uh, uh, on, on that, you, you won't get anywhere. I mean, we did do interviews running to three quarters of an hour with a thousand different individuals representing, genuinely representing, the range of people. And what the results were very surprising to politicians, apart from the else, because what it gave them was the confidence when loud-mouthed groups started shouting the, the, the odds, they could turn around and say, well, actually, you represent a minority. We have the information about this. That is critical. Now, you've also mentioned in um, your bad example, obviously, how, why it went wrong. And why is it that local authority keep making the same mistakes? So you, you've given us a good example uh, and getting public opinion. Why don't they just keep repeating the same good example again and again and again? <laughs> uh, well, good question. I mean, I, I, I don't know. It's, it, it, it's easier that way, I guess. The, the, the way that bureaucracies work, and particularly local authorities, is they, they have a job to 
do to deal with a particular set of issues, and very often it's divided up into particular you know, transport here, housing over there, planning over there. It, 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 the whole sort of management is what uh, Sir Clawson was talking about. It's management, not leadership. What Birmingham was very lucky to have was leadership on this at a particular time. Um, it's like what Manchester has now. They've got leadership, but it, it, it's, it, but management tends to produce exactly the result you've, you've said, and that's why it's more common. Management is more common than leadership, sadly. Just also, you've mentioned property development brings in jobs, say, and so you've got employed people. If you've got uh, property development and it's bringing in the jobs, doesn't lifestyle automatically improve then because you've got investors coming in who want to invest uh, and uh, sponsor public spaces and community spaces for us? Well, that, that's the, the theory. Unfortunately, it's not the practice. I mean, w developers are interested in building their, their scheme, getting it tenanted, and moving on rapidly. If, you, if there's not a, a strong planning system keeping a, 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 a control of the whole thing, all that happens is you move the pieces of the jigsaw around. And very often, we've seen in the, in the retail business, for example, we've had vast retail developments uh, but at the same time, existing centres have gone down the plug hole and internet shopping has taken over. The, the whole thing, there aren't, you, know, you do not create jobs by building shops. And, you, know, you don't create trade by building shops. And that, the same is true of, of office developments and other forms of commercial development. Unless there's some un other factor driving it, you just shift the piece of the jigsaw around. Property development is not the same as economic How development. How does Birmingham bring in the investment and the funding... Just, uh, you talked about some issues about internet shopping taking over, mm. high street dying. So how do we as a city recover from that? Well, I, I think it, that what you need to do, do is to understand where the, where the drivers of economic change are. And they're in innovation primarily. It's how do you get um, things that are successful, replicated? How do you take new products and new ideas and bring them into production on a, on a, on a, a, a wider scale. I've been involved in this for many years, both as a consultant and I used to chair the NHS Innovation Hub for the West Midlands. And it, it is a long, it's like what I was talking about, social change. It's a long, slow process, but it, and it requires money. It, and the market will not do it by itself. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. And so to you, what do you think? Do you think that's an overstated issue, an issue that is, now uh, we've got quite a lot of hands. Uh, the gentleman just behind me. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I have a few things here. Uh, first, I just wanted to quickly say that, as you said, that the Paradise development and Centenaire Square development, uh, I think, you said too big or uh, something like that. I thought, in my opinion, both of them are very good and classy developments for Birmingham. I think Centenary Square is a public space that is much needed. And up to this point, it was a hugely underused and wasted potential. And Paradise could certainly be better, but it has a very good street interaction and no uh, dead frontages, which I, which I think is very important, and it's, it's done the job. Then one thing you said wasn't clear to me at all. You said uh, that back in the 80s or so, the city center wasn't very good for local people. It was good. Or was it the other way around? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, well, Alan, we'll yeah. perhaps you'll... Uh, it, it wasn't... I've seen, obviously, I, I haven't been here in the 80s or the 70s, but I've, se <laughs> I've seen photos and videos and stuff like that, and it did look like a horrible place, I must say. Well, <laughs> as, much, as much as I love Birmingham, obviously, I'm not from here, as you can hear, but I've come to love the city. I'd like to think I'm an adopted Brummie and all that, but it looked like a horrible city back then. <laughs> and so it's not quite clear to me. What do you think that, how, why do you think it's not a good place for locals now? Because it seems okay. like a great place for the locals. Well, it, it, like I said, I mean, the emphasis has been since then on re redevelopment of the city centre, and undoubtedly that has shifted the balance so that 
the city centre is more attractive than it was in the 80s, but my point is that it's not nearly as attractive as it should be if it's going to be the core of a, of a, of a sort of city that is in, on a European scale is, is a major kind of attracting point. I, I just don't think we're in the same league. I've been to it's lots of... Still work in progress. <laughs> Sorry? Well, it's still work in progress. Work in progress, very much so, but I hope in progress rather than retrograde is my view. So we'll, we'll pass that. Other questions? There's a lady at the very back, I think. I've lived in London. I work in Manchester. And I think we are falling behind on a national and international scale. When we look at our metro that has only just recently expanded, the fees that we charge on that are horrific to loop you around the city unless you have a free pass. Manchester does not charge for its light transport within the city centre. Birmingham lets development happen to it, and as you said, with lax planning laws and concepts that don't take Birmingham as a whole. So we have an amazing centrepiece in our library. However, it's only open six days a week, and that's <laughs> reduced hours. So it looks amazing. It's the red building on your signage. But as a Brummie who might want to go and use the library as a space to work, on a Sunday, that's not mm. an option. We need to take back control of our city for us as Brummies <coughs> and then invite in our international and our national visitors. Because the moment with the metro that has very little work happening on it every day it appears, the whole city is a complete mess. But I agree with you. I think mm. place making or urban regeneration has to have the community at the heart of it before we can take on the physical space. So there seemed to be a lot of noise, sorry, there of agreement. Would just in a show of hands, who actually who agrees with that? Who thinks that's a reason? So that's pretty much everyone. Okay, wow. That's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I couldn't agree more about the metro. I, 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 it really grieves me that back in 1989 we had worked out in Birmingham the first city in this country, an integrated transport strategy. We'd got agreement from the government that uh, we could change the balance of funding between roads, which had always taken the lion's share, to more like to 50-50 roads and, and, and rail. We were all set to go, and the government said they supported it. Unfortunately, and, and I remember meeting the minister at that time, and his civil servant said, oh, you can't do that, minister, they're separate pockets of money and I said they're separate pockets but the same pair of trousers and you're wearing them <laughs> and you know it, it wasn't the brightest spark <laughs> but he, he, he did oh, I, I answer, and for a short while it happened but the civil servants fought back this is what happens when central government tries to run local things Dean say over shoulder I wouldn't do it like that you know and what happened was all the road schemes got passed by the, the, the economic appraisal process. None of the rail schemes did. I took it up with Andrew Adonis when he came to speak here a couple of years ago. I said, you betrayed us. And I had quite a bit of correspondence in about it. And in the end, he said, yeah, I probably did. But I mean, you know, that a bit late, but you know, it, it, it is really depressing that unlike most continental European countries, we never spent proper money on sorting out our city transport systems. We're, we're now about to spend billions lots of billions on high-speed rail. That is not actually the priority. And, you know, it, 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 it grieves me to say we're still fiddling around, doing little bits and pieces here and there. You're absolutely right. Enormous disruption, but, but not an adequate return because it's too little, too late, and not well enough integrated. So who would be the per who, who would do that integrating? Is that a, a Whitehall thing that should pass the power to local government, or it's something that local government... It's, some, it's something the local government must, must do. Another little bit of story... I was asked to review a book recently about the, Bur the, the Belfast Urban Motorway, or BUM, <laughs> um, which is a classic example of why you should never let central government run local things. They have been trying for about 40 years now to build the, Bur the Belfast Urban Motorway, and it has, it has run into one thing after another. And, but the central government, unlike Birmingham, where we backed off and said, actually, this is not going anywhere, we need to change it, in, in fact, we did that in, in 1989. In Belfast, they carried on. And as a result, they still haven't built the, Birmingham, the Belfast Urban Motorway, but they haven't got anything else either. And it's, not, it's, a, it's a disaster. I mean, so, so I, mean, I, I think central government is not the answer. It's, it, you've got to give local governments proper powers and proper resources to do this stuff. 
and then back off. Uh, to really leap on the back of these comments and questions about uh, transport, can I, I, I add to the weight uh, uh, of the argument that Birmingham has a real car problem? Um, so in comparison with a city like London, where people are out on the streets walking about, bumping into each other, doing exciting things, there's a real buzz there. Mm -hmm. Birmingham, because of the way it's divided up by these big trunk roads, yeah. um, has a real issue. So for instance, I live in the south of Birmingham. There is a train. Uh, which comes by every hour. But if I'm trying to go and do a job in Bearwood, which I did today, and then come into the city centre, it's both cheaper and quicker for me to drive out to Bearwood and then drive and park in the city centre yeah, than yeah, it is to yeah. go. So why is it that, for instance, in London, when they decided they were going to build massive trunk roads and ring roads, the communities stepped up and yeah. rejected those options? Why did that happen in London? Why, hasn't it happened? why didn't it happen in Birmingham? What can we do about it? Well, it did happen in Birmingham. The community did rise up and reject the, the road plans. But what happened in London is having rejected the road plans, there was something else. There was huge expenditure on upgrading the tube, which actually had mostly been built before any of this happened. Um, that's the difference. You know, it, it, London, you're absolutely dead right, it, it is not nearly as car dependent as Birmingham. And one of the things that came out of the, the, research, the opinion research that I did was that the top problem that Birmingham people saw was of the way that cars dominated the environment. They, that was actually number one in, their, in their, uh, their set of concerns about Birmingham. That was, you know, from the, the user point of view, it was as bad as that. And the gentleman at the very front, and this will be the last question for, for Alan. Hello. I think, the, I think the biggest issue in Birmingham has to be public transport. When we look at London with its underground rail system, Manchester with its, with its tram system, we really are lacking quite badly behind. I mean, I know recently we've introduced our version of the Oyster card. People can make contactless payments on the buses using their debit cards. But I think what we really need to do is not just focus on developing the surface transport system, but also focus on developing an underground transport system for the West Midlands, so that all the core cities are linked together. It improves investor confidence, so new jobs are created, and hopefully jobs that will pay a reasonable salary and will have reasonable security and also to get money in the economy flowing. So, for example, if you, live in a, if you live on the outskirts of Birmingham, if you have an underground system, you can get easily to the centre. You can, you can go to arts, ven arts and cultural venues, go shopping. Again, that's putting money into the economy. And not only will that benefit Birmingham as a city and the West Midlands as a whole, but that will also give Birmingham a chance to invest more money into its public services as well. So if people are saying, well, public services aren't good enough or they haven't got enough money, we can then have the opportunity to say, well, actually, if we have an, if we have an adequate public transport system, we can put more money into those services. But and if also, we, if, sorry, if we, have, if, we haven't got, if we haven't got money for public services, is it, how does that money get raised by Birmingham? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I... Well, I, I mean, I mean, I'd say that the money could be raised by Birmingham simply by people going into shops and shopping, people going into cultural venues. The money that's paid from that comes out from taxes into business rates, and then the business rates can, and the money made from the business rates can be invested into the services. Yeah, um, there's few people in between in all of that. I mean, I, I, I agree with the, the gist of what you're saying. I, I, the, the, the notion of having underground, particularly in the city centre, was, you know, I would, I backed that. But I, I, I was told it's just too expensive. We had to, we had to go for light rail service transport, which is a shame because actually when you look at most European cities, or continental European cities, Birmingham scale, they have extensive underground as well as overground, and we need we need that. But you know that that's that's history. Um, in terms of the money, I mean, uh, it's quite difficult to to attach the money in the way that you suggest. This essentially has to be done. It can't be done on a sort of you pay so much in the shop and so much of it goes into uh, a public transport system. Though interesting, the French do something a bit like that. They have a tax re directly related to payroll, which is goes into um, the, the, the the public transport system, but um, it, 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 it that requires a lot of history behind it and, and a lot which we don't have. The, the Germans had a tax on 
on fuel, which had to go into public transport. Eight fennigs a, a litre, it was. Um, and that was it. But, you know, that was not the case in this country. We had a culture and a, and a, and a system of government which did not give provincial cities the power to do that kind of thing. Other countries done it differently and they've done it better. Okay, thank you, Alan. And next up is Aisha Iqbal. She is the founder of Adara, a women, women's network uh, for the West Midlands and presented a documentary on Birmingham for BBC Three earlier this year. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to thank the hearing for inviting me and giving me the platform um, to share my views and experiences and to be able to help conclude what we together as people of this beautiful city um, can do to ensure that we remain united and most importantly, safe. Um, my name is Aisha Iqbal. I'm one of the founders of Adara Women's Support Network and I run this organisation um, alongside my sister, Kiran Iqbal. Um, we are a family-run organisation and service because we identified the gap um, in Birmingham where we felt like there wasn't enough safe spaces for women uh, where they can go and um, um, you know, grow and learn and share and support, gain the support and we decided to create the space ourselves. Um, we have a two-part entity so we offer a support network and then we've also got a sanctuary and wellbeing spa. Let's give you some stats. Um, we are one of the largest local authorities in UK serving over one million citizens. Um, we're a youthful city, so almost 50% of our population are under the age of 30. Birmingham is the most culturally mixed city in the UK, with 42% non-whites, according to the 2011 figures. And outside of London, Birmingham also has the largest um, Muslim population, um, followed by Sikh and then um, Buddhist population. I was born here and, um, I mean, I spent three years away um, in Leicester, but obviously, as you can tell, I haven't lost my accent, so I came back. I um, studied in youth and community development, and um, this is where my journey began in um, working with people, and I, made, I ensured that I could return back to Birmingham and use my skills here. Some of the um, challenges, going to the challenges of Birmingham, um, are the deprivation. So around 40% of Birmingham's population live in areas which come in the most, um, in 10% of the most deprived in England. Around one third of children living here are classified as living in poverty. And we have a skills mismatch, so low proportion of highly skilled residents. Um, on top of that, one of our main issues, which is something that I, um, I'm deeply concerned about is the unemployment rate um, significantly above national average and high youth unemployment. Um, so, so looking at some of these issues left me deeply concerned, even more than I already was, and even more because my laptop's just playing up. <laughs> that'll that'll oh, teach it, that'll teach it. Oh, no. And you know, my printer wasn't working, so I couldn't print it out. <laughs> I'm so sorry. OK. Well, it's 20% complete. Well, while it, maybe while it reboots, um, I'll just ask you a quick question. And while it reboots, you said that you went away but came, but came back to Birmingham. Yeah. And that's not always a route that people take yeah. there's often has been a case of people leaving Birmingham being well educated or educated educated in a particular area and using those skills elsewhere but you came back to the city why um, because I felt like Birmingham needed <laughs> needed my help whatever I could do I wanted to do it in Birmingham um, and you know going through a lot of the sh um, I mean my own family needed me Mm. Um, and some of, the, some of the issues I'm going to cover, I've lived through them and, um, and first of all had to help, help um, my own family before I could help others and to do this I came back to Birmingham. Well, are there, were there particular things that Birmingham faced then that you thought could be done, not even at a kind of level of, of the council or the level of the government, but actually at the, a kind of personal level then? There are things that you felt could be addressed as an individual citizen in the city that actually needed no help from local authority or local uh, government initiative, but simply could be kind of taken by the scruff of the neck then? Is yes, definitely. Saying? I mean, that's how we began. Um, our journey was um, purely grassroots, working with communities. Um, however, the only challenge that came from that, so, I mean, if people come together and do this, it's, it's um, mainly done voluntarily, but sometimes it's not always sustainable. 
that's it that's the issue that we found and that's why we had to come up with a concept to make our work sustainable so even when i have seen um when i have seen individuals in the community taking a stand and doing something about it they are also facing issues on sustaining the work they're trying to do. Um, what, what, what do you mean by that? So it means um, funding the work they do. So if they're supporting people and helping people, um, you know, apart from giving their time, which time is money anyway, um, they need resources. They need, um, they need um, to be equipped and in a sustainable position themselves to be able to help others. Now, um, this could be, um, you know, even if you're trying to help, just for an example, if you're trying to help somebody who's in a struggle and they, they just need that sort of breathing space because they're struggling, it's normally sometimes financial issues. So, so as a citizen doing something then, yeah. do you think that the barrier, the kind of entry barrier is too high or the entry bar is too high then to actually get something off the ground? You've had an initiative to go and do something and yet mm. very early on these struggles have been no, in front of you. No, I think that everyone can do something. But I think it's just um, a struggle for people to do it on their own. So there needs to definitely be a community um, element to it. There needs to be um, support around the people who are trying to take the stand. So it's difficult for them to do it alone. So we, we started in 2012 um, alone. And um, there was only so much me and my sister could do. So that is when we had to go out there and um, you know, take up more support from the community. And that's when we turned to. Um, and then we, re then we officially registered. And you have to go down these routes if you officially want to make a change. Like I said, you can only do so much on the ground alone. Did you find that process easy or difficult? Or that process of then kind of institutionalizing yourself? in Birmingham? It wasn't easy, but then it wasn't um, impossible. But Could, yeah, you definitely got to have some fight though. Why? What does that mean? Because, um, I mean, there, it does come with challenges and it does come with sustaining your project now, even gaining the knowledge of how to do this. But this is why we exist. It's just the top one. Thank you. The top one, yeah. Thank you. Um, I never thought I'd be an IT assistant. <laughs> yeah. You might not be. No. <laughs> um, I lost my thread of thought there. Um, so yeah, I mean, we did, uh, when we got, it, I mean, it was difficult, but we did a lot of work um, by ourselves using initiative and um, picking, uh, just using the skills that we picked up ourselves by okay. researching, but could, I just think some people wouldn't know where could, to turn. Could you have been helped more then by, I don't know, local government, local business? In, I'm, we're trying to get to, I suppose, what Birmingham can do more of. You've had an initiative. But then we were, yet. this is the thing, this, okay, we, we, did, we did get the support from local um, council and that's how we took it to the next right. level, so yeah. thank you. We're back up My and, pleasure. and almost out thank of time. <laughs> oh no, sorry. No, 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 okay. okay, we'll have a couple of minutes, maybe the most prescient. Okay, so um, I mean, I'm always left in feeling inspired whenever I hear about women overcoming hardships in my life. But in, um, but in, in order to truly witness the strength of women, one must experience it for themselves. I have personally seen how the perseverance of one woman has led to a positive impact in my life and my upbringing. Being brought up by my widowed mother, I witnessed the sheer determination a woman can display and how she can harness that power and grit to create a difference in the lives of children, in her, of her children, despite battling with life's challenges alone. All women have the potential to make a difference, yet unfortunately, some women do not know how to nurture that potential in order to bring it to the forefront and use it. So I'm just going to give you some examples of, um, and I'm going to use them from my own life. I can give you many examples from a lot of the cases that I've been dealing with over the years. However, after seeing my own mum, um, I mean, that, this was my first sort of live case study where I was, which, I, which helped me assess um, where the gaps are and what lack of awareness and education and um, not being able to um, have the skills to integrate what it can do and even cultural um, influences and barriers, what it can do to a family. So um, my, mom was, um, my mom was widowed when she was 28 years old and she was pregnant at the time with me. And um, after losing my father, she was left in the deep end. She had um, no, in no English skills, so she wasn't speaking English. She wasn't working because she was quite, pa she was pampered by my father who, he, I mean, he'd, he'd, he'd been living here from when he was 11 years old, but mom, mom came over afterwards. Um, so she was um, living here seven years just before he passed away. And um, when she was left in the deep end with three children, no English, no work, um, but lucky enough, she had some support, family support. However, she still had to do it for herself. So I saw, um, she brought us up, she learned to drive, she, le she went and got work. Um, but lucky enough, her work was still 
um, surrounding people who could speak the same language. So the English bit, she still didn't um, get to. But um, what, what it was with, my, just to give you an example of me and my brother. So she, she sort of um, brought us up slightly differently. So my brother in our culture, you know, was left to do um, what he needs to do. And I was, um, I was, you know, looked after at home, lucky enough by an uncle and auntie who treated me like their own, um, gave me the support and nurture and everything I needed. And my mum always motivated me to, you know, pay attention in school, um, make sure I'm studying, make sure I make, uh, do something with myself. Whereas my brother dropped out when he was 15. Um, and, you know, it was okay for him to do that. It wasn't, I mean, I, mean, I knew she wasn't unha unhappy with it, but there was not, the pressure wasn't put on him like it was on me. So, I mean, um, growing up, obviously I've, I've managed to take the positive from seeing my mother um, do what she does and set up the organisation because I didn't want women to um, suffer in the way she did. Um, we teach English now, we educate women through workshops and training and we offer them personal, professional, social development opportunities Thank in various you. ways. Thank you, Aisha. Oh, we'll, we'll, have some, we'll have some questions and build it from the audience. Yeah, well. no Great problem. No sure. problem. Sorry to cut you short there, but uh, just timing. In terms of um, what you're saying and your background, yep. I can see that obviously your focus is very much empowering women. And my question to you is, a lot of, there's been a lot of talk recently that actually in more traditional areas, which is um, kind of the focus that you've got, is areas where people have got more traditional family structures. It's actually the men, the young men, that are struggling. So minority young men are the ones perhaps that are falling behind, whereas the women are ahead. So shouldn't we, as a city, be empowering minority men um, and even non-minority young boys to, to obtain a better future for themselves rather than focusing on women? Yeah. Um, why I focus on women is, and in particular mothers in my work, is because um, um, these men have mothers and these mothers have a major influence on, on these young men. So if mothers were more educated and aware um, of the issues that, um, that their children may be facing, then they, they should be able to empower and um, educate their young men. My worry is that you're perpetuating a, a stereotype by putting women as mothers yeah. and as the main carers, whereas actually now you'll see around you now it's uh, both people are working, they have to, yeah. uh, children are in childcare, extended family, and men are very much also taking a central role in childcare. Um, so shouldn't, again, shouldn't we move away from those stereotypes? No, and I agree, it's, it's definitely not just on the women, whereas um, why we focus on the women is because I just feel like they, um, they do have the extra pressures. I mean, especially in, I mean, where we're situated, it is a predominantly um, um, Asian area. There's a lot of um, people from traditional cultural backgrounds, and um, that's sort of the makeup of the area and what we face, and that's why we focus on women. But we have started to now, second year into our work, we have started to expand into working with families as well and educate um, the whole family, not just on the women. So you are right in that sense. Um, fathers definitely have a major role to play as well. And, you know, if I was to expand my work, it would go into doing the same work I'm doing with women, but for men. But why I'm focused so much on women is just to offer that safe space. It's, it's easier for them to... You've yeah. kind of moved on to the area that I was going to go on to next, which is families. You've said that you're going to, you, you are starting to focus on families. Isn't that a very individual uh, way to move? How, co how can we work at such a grassroots level? How can we make change at, at a family level? Isn't it just too much? This is why we started with just women. However, there are groups who... Um, I mean, what I've started to do is to reach out to more people because there's only so much we can do in one area. Um, we are working with other grassroots organisations who are maybe more focused on young people and then another one working with just the men and you know, others who work with... Um, both parents. Um, we spread the message out through other organisations who manage to um, you know, get in a diverse group of people in. Finally, I mean, you mentioned uh, when you were speaking to Frank that um, the local authority assisted you to set up yourselves. Why are why aren't more people doing that? Why don't more people know that the local authority can help them and they can also make a difference? And this is um, yeah, and I do think there needs to be more out there to assist people in setting up their own networks and setting up their own um, services and organisations. However. Um, we, and, and it was a by chance, it happened for us as well. We didn't know where to go to look for it. We actually were doing what we could and got spotted through that way. But um, I think it's not, yeah, I think there definitely needs to be more out there to help people 
um, set up and get the support they need. Thank you, Aisha. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. So, what are the thoughts from the floor? We have a few hands. Maybe the uh, two in the, at the front. Hi, um, I work for a charity that supports unemployed young people. And um, really, you talked about the high rise of youth unemployment and about violent crime and the disenfranchisement of young people that's po possibly led to this. So, how do you? think that we should stop young people from being left behind, from being disenfranchised? I think it's um, maybe not even Birmingham having lack of opportunities. I think we have opportunities. It's just helping the young people find them. So they need more guidance. And I think since our youth services have been cut, I do believe that a lot more young people have gone astray and they don't have places to pay people places or people to turn to. So we need more outreach work. We need um, more youth services back on board. But I think it's going to have to be done independently. I do believe there needs to be people in the community um, doing something about it or helping guide the young people to what's already out there. OK. So just also for some statistics, Birmingham's youth unemployment is at almost 9% um, in, the, in the labour market update from the council in January, which is well above the national average? Um, I was just going to ask, first of all, well done for putting it with your technical difficulty. Um, I think something that links the two uh, comments is the statistics that you read out. So I think you said 30 or 40 percent, um, completely gone blank, but a third of children living in poverty. Yeah, one third. And 40 percent um, we're on, do you mean the <coughs> living deprivation? Living so. deprivation, right. Yeah. And that's concentrated in certain pockets of the city. It's also, um, you know, if we are the, what, a really young city and a quite heavily migrant city, then there's not um, family, family wealth on the most part compared to cities like London and maybe some of the more prosperous people in um, the northern industrial towns. So the question is, do you think part of, you know, it's, it's all well and good to talk about integration and to work on um, siloed pockets of um, so certain women. Um, but the issue is maybe that without the planning aspect and without um, housing in being more dispersed and people being more dispersed, um, there's always going to be ghettoization and lack of integration in certain areas. I do agree with that, and um, one thing that I, I mean, a project that I set up just to help, um, just uh, two areas was um, we, and this was where the BBC um, followed the documentary, which was crossing Birmingham's invisible borders, and that's why I literally had to do. So we had Rude Heath and Borsal Heath, two. Um, I mean, we had a predominantly Asian, um, black minor, ethnic minority community, and then we had um, Rude Heath, which was uh, mainly a, a white community, and uh, we we took two groups and try to integrate them by just um, overlapping and making them uh, visit each other's areas and doing activities together. Now, this was just a very small project, but it highlighted so much. Um, it was actually a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. I actually thought it was going to be quite straightforward, quite easy, but it actually, uh, what we found was there was so much trust issues, um, there, was so, there was misunderstandings, um, lack, of, like, um, lack of trust, and, um, and that just showed like sort of a lot of the, the bigger problem we've got because I was just focusing on two groups from two areas in the whole of Birmingham. So. Hi. Um, I was wondering, you talked a lot about getting people involved in their local community to make a difference, um, and also how you set up your organisation in order to make a difference to women and, and young people. Do you think that in order to make a difference across the city, do people need to organise themselves in that way? Because obviously that requires quite a lot of resources and you may need to go to the council or the government to mm -hmm. actually get some support in doing that. What, I mean, my experience in Birmingham is that people often lack confidence to actually make a difference in their local community, even checking in on... Um, Nadia next door and helping her as a single mother or an older person who may just need help putting out the bins or something like that. Do you think there's something around um, 
increasing people's confidence levels in order for them to make a, an immediate difference in their very local neighbourhood? And how would you go about doing that? Yes, um, definitely. So confidence and empowerment, that is um, sort of the foundation of also our, our work. So um, we need to empower young people. And in, in my perspective, especially um, women from um, traditional social backgrounds and provide them with um, better employment opportunities in the city. And you have to be empowered to, in order to create or take advantage of these opportunities. Because if you haven't got the confidence or um, to approach or take off advantage, you're not going to be able to do it. So this means in having the confidence, being able to um, be an agent to your own future. So this is what we help women do. We help build their confidence and empower them so they feel confident enough to take up opportunities. And the same for not just women, but young people or any individual. Aisha, don't you think that the local authorities pick and choose the communities that they help in Birmingham? I don't think it's as easy to um, get the support, I agree. Um, it's, um, I think people can't really depend on turning to local authorities and government. I think we have to be really in innovative, so this is why I set up the business. So we do have a spa and gym facility which helps fund some of our work. We have been fortunate enough to get some support, however, even that support we can is not guaranteed, it's not um, long-term sustainable, so this is why I think we have to think of ways to sustain ourselves and we have to get creative. I'm a woman on my own in Birmingham. I've been here six years. So I fought for health care for my child and I still don't have a camp to live on beside my own type of people. You understand? I'm mm -hmm. not accepted in the community where I live and the council is against me, not for me. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. I've tried to get help from how many different <sighs> places. So you're saying women should empower themselves. That's really hard. You had your family and things like that. If you're a woman on your own in Birmingham with children, the doors just keep closing. Do you think mm. that's an issue in, sorry? Yeah, no, Do you no. think that's an issue specifically in Birmingham or, or a wider issue? I don't know, so I'm, I don't know. I'm British Roman Gypsy, so I've lived in how many cities in, in, in the UK? Birmingham is the most racist city I've ever been in in my life. Mm. What is Everybody else think to that? Because I was going to... May I tell you the problem in Birmingham? The, the, the Birmingham City Council won't build a transit camp. So that means that West Midlands Police don't have the powers to use Section 60, 61 and 62 to get rid of the unauthorised encampments. So that causes more hatred for the GRT community. You understand, there's a simple solution to the problems that you face every single summer. There's a simple solution, and it's the local authority, Birmingham City Council, that can solve this problem. So that means that I have to live my life with death threats, bad things happen to me, my children. You understand, because of the hatred towards the gypsy community in Birmingham. I'm a woman on my own with two children. It's hard to sleep at night with death threats. I'm really sorry for the experience that you've had. Um, I mean, it would probably be a good idea for us to talk after this event. And um, You're not going to change Birmingham City Council? No, I can't do that, Everyone but I can do what I... I, I can only Birmingham try and... Um, because there's, so. there are ser services who possibly probably work independently, and maybe we can get some support that way. OK. I think, thank you. And um, we will... Thank you, Aisha. That's cool. Thank you. And finally, I'd like to introduce Sundar Katwala, who is the director of British Future, the non-partisan think tank that looks at issues of identity, integration, and opportunity around the country. The former general secretary of the Fabian Society and leader writer for The Observer, and a current member of the West Midlands Leadership Commission, which looks into how the region's leadership might better represent its population. Sundar. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. It's great to uh, have the invitation to join you um, here. Um, I'm pleased I'm batting quite low down the batting order here because I join you as an imposter, uh, unlike Frank and John and Aisha and Alan. I'm not, I'm not bringing you a Brummie perspective on Brummie so, and Birmingham, so I'm going to be listening to that, but I'll give you some thoughts from the outside about, uh, about identity and cities and what that might mean for Birmingham. Now, British Future's been doing quite a lot of work in the West Midlands, including in Birmingham, as part of the work we've been doing on identity and integration. We published a recent report, Many Rivers Crossed, which was based on spending a lot of time in 
in Wolverhampton, in Birmingham, in Dudley, and then do national surveys on how we changed in the 50 years since Enoch Powell made that speech, which we thought was a very big national moment, but also a moment that happened here when we were very interested in the stories of older people and younger people about why today was very different. But cities, identities matter to cities. Cities are places of stories, they're places of people. People tell stories. We've got 100 different ideas in the room about the identity of a city, a million different sort of roots into that story around the city. So cities tell stories, but who are those stories for? Who's the identity of a city for? And there's been, I think, a trend, especially if you go back to sort of around the millennium, the age of the dome, um, that the identity of the city wasn't really for you. Um, it wasn't really for the city itself. The identity of the city was something for the external world. There was a phase of rebranding a city. And there's a good reason to sort of do that, because you want to get investment from overseas. You want to encourage people to visit as students and come and study and put money into the economy. You want tourists. You want visitors. So cities tell stories to the external world about themselves, because they're marketing themselves. You know, you had an organisation called Marketing Birmingham uh, for many years, now turned into the West Midlands Growth Company. You've got to decide, you know, is it, is it the identity of a city or is it the identity of a region? In China, do they want to hear about Birmingham, Coventry, Wolverhampton, the black country being slightly different, or is that a bit too simple? So there's been a sort of telling a story out there to sell yourselves to the world, but that can be difficult because the picture postcard of the iconic buildings and what you put in the brochure won't be the true story you actually feel about your city and you've got to tell that story as well you know a lot of strong local pride uh, in a place like this but can that be combined with an awareness of what needs to change what needs to be overcome can we tell honest stories that that work so you know Birmingham has been rebranded a few times but you never know if the people in it know it's been rebranded it's rebranded in 2003 with a there's a lowercase b for Birmingham <laughs> it stood for a city powered by its people with values of diversity and dynamism but the brand wasn't powered by the people and so I'm not sure the people knew about the brand so so I think the challenge here uh, 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 you know look forward a new moment for a young city four years away the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, a new global showcase to tell your story to the world. What should that story be? Who should decide it? Who should tell it? And what needs to happen between now and then for the identity story the city wants to tell the world to be the same as the one it wants to tell itself? An aspiration and a vision, but also how to change, actually, what should happen. So that's the challenge. How could we have um, a story owned by Birmingham told to the world about Birmingham, not owned by the advertising agency that, that decides to come up with it and then put on telly uh, for you all to watch. And my solution is a structured public conversation about Birmingham, its identity, its integration, that informs the vision that's told to the world, but also tries to change, drive the changes here that bridge the gaps between the city you'd like to be um, and where you currently start. So the big brummy conversation is, is what I'd like to see happen. Um, you should decide what the questions are. Here are some of the questions I'd like to see that address. A question about identity. What makes Birmingham special? Are you proud to be a Brummie? If you're proud, what makes you proud? If you're not, why not? How does it fit with these other identities, more local identities, different ideas? Do they fit well? Are they in tension? A question about change. Not what's wrong with Birmingham. That would be a bit of a negative question to ask, wouldn't it? But what's the most important thing you want to change? Might be the transport system. Alan could be the transport czar. But, you know, it's important to know that as well. Um, a question about inclusion and exclusion. What divides Birmingham? It's fine to be divided between different tribes with different coloured football scarves. That's kind of, that's good. But there are other divides, barriers that we want to do more to overcome. <laughs> Which ones matter? Uh, and, and what are we going to do about them? I'd like to ask a question about arrivals and belonging. Can you come from elsewhere and become a Brummie? People who've done that, how did it work? What made it work? What made it harder? Can the people who come in and the people who live here do things to make that work better and more often? What do we think about that? And then a story, I think, about Birmingham's story that it wants to tell and how it wants to tell it. What's the one thing that the world doesn't know about Birmingham that in three or four years' time you want them to know? That, that would be my aim 
of a conversation. How do you have a conversation like that that works? And I thought Alan gave us a masterclass on how not to do participation, how to do it. So he's made all of the cases I want. I don't want a committee of experts. I want genuine participation, I want consultation before, not kind of what do you think we've practically decided, but you know, you can change the font if you like. We're consulting you now. Um, and I don't just want to survey people. I don't want people to sit there atomized on their computer late at night and just fill in a survey. I want people to talk to each other about it before they answer questions. So how do you have little conversations? How do you invite, how do you involve all of the schools? We've got a few years to do it. How can every school have a conversation that makes part of this? What can the universities do? What can civic groups do? Uh, neighbourhoods do? So yes, we'll survey as well. Yes, we'll invest properly in research capacity to get to neighbourhoods that won't turn up if it's just the people who do consultations. But, but how can we do that? So let people have the conversations in their own way. Send in the answers to the big questions as well, but be creative as well. 30 seconds clips and on social media, let's hear the conversation. And then the big challenge is what do you do with it? Firstly, this is what doesn't happen. That happens sometimes. You never sustain it. Once you start the conversation, keep it going. What's you in the second year? Should we narrow it down and talk about education, opportunity, or transport? Or actually, if there were divisions, can we bridge and connect? Let's have it again with the people we thought we weren't in contact with. Let's link up some schools, let's link up some faith groups and have the same conversation again about what, we're, what we think we could share, but we don't share enough. How do you drive change at home with the story? The identity discussion here is only going to matter if it informs the discussion about education, about opportunity, about gender, about power, and about place. Then the identity conversation is doing something. So for the decision makers in power, feedback into how it's informing. You know, you've got a story about inclusive growth, you've got a story about place. Do we need an integration strategy for the city? Can the public own what it does? I think that's the really important bit where it feels that it's not just about the gloss and the brochure, it's about the changes that are happening so that the idea of the city reflects the city. And then if you do the hard work, I think you can have the party and invite everybody to it. Birmingham's voice in 2022, not just 2022 and the Commonwealth Games, you've got other big moments to tell your story. But when you tell that story, can it be a story? And how can it be a story? And how can it be heard to be a story from the people, by the people? Because it should be you who tell your story to the world about the changes in Birmingham that you're trying to imagine and build together. So that's my big, brummy conversation. Let's have a conversation about identity, but let's have a conversation about identity because that could help us make change on all the things that really matter. Thank you, Sunda. Thank you, Sunda. That was um, very interesting. Um, in terms of what you were saying about the big, brummy conversation, um, how would it practically work? How would you reach all the areas? You were saying that you know, people would go to areas where they're not known for participating. How? You, you, can, you can do this, but you've got to do it well. I want people to have little conversations, not for the people, hundreds of people in town halls. Yes, let's do that. I think groups like Citizens can do that and get hundreds and thousands. We should do that once or twice as a showcase. I want six, 10, 8, 12 people to do it. And so I think you've got to provide toolkits. You've got to provide them. You've got to go and talk to schools and faith groups about how to do it. I think people can do it if they're told, you know, do it in your own space, do it in your kitchen, do it with your friends. It's harder to do the bridging version, but I think that might be the second round. And I think you have to put capacity then and support from local government to make sure it happens in the place that might not do it. You know, that actually it shouldn't be that hard, I think, for the schools, especially with the Commonwealth Games as part of what we're trying to do. So a lot of it shouldn't be hard for schools to find a way and find a space to do it. But it might be harder on places where people feel there's, uh, you know, lower social capital, lower confidence. People might need support to go and do it. And so I think if you invest in that, and you do invest, I think, in the research of the people who aren't going to turn up as well to check that you haven't just heard an unrepresentative group. So so I think you've got to put quite a lot of capacity into doing it, and you've got to do it for a sustained period of time. And then engage the media as well. This is quite fun. And so, you know, you can, do, you can also do a slightly lighter version. But I think, I think you have to spend time talking to people about where it's going to go and why it's going to matter. It sounds fun, and it sounds really like an ideal. But in terms of cost, wouldn't it just be phenomenal? It's not, it's, not, it's not very expensive, especially if, you know, you've got the, you know, as I say, you should invest capacity in trying to make sure the communities in place that might not participate do that. If you had a team of three or four people going out and helping people hold the conversations, that would work. Other people can do it, do it themselves. And British Future has been doing something a bit like this, but on a national scale where we've held 120 meetings in, 
in 60 towns and cities about the future of immigration after Brexit. And really, that's two people from two organisations just going around and holding, you know, holding two meetings a day, you know, every Thursday in different places. So it doesn't take enormous capacity, but it does take sustained effort to make sure you do it, and then you, you knit it together, and you tell the people who participated what happened, actually, to the views that they shared. When you say you knit it together, again, isn't it a certain uh, person or certain people in power who are interpreting, again, what's been said, so you get may maybe the view, the vision's narrowed, or uh, it becomes an interpretation? of a certain person? It could happen. I think be as transparent as you can. And I think a really big test is when people know there's a, there's a divisive issue as well as an inclusive issue. And yes, it's a happy party you're going to invite the world to, but actually we want to be honest in the three or four years about the change. If people think that that was swept under the carpet and that no one was allowed to say that, or everyone did say that, but actually it was left out because people wanted a picture postcard of Selfridges and they didn't want the difficult issue, then, then people know that actually. And then they will be sceptical and they'll say, you pretended to listen but you'd already decided. So I think, I think you win trust by being transparent, by being honest, and the more, that, the more that people actually hear the voices of people who participated, and, you know, it, lots of people have got a mobile phone and they can speak for 30 seconds into it. So, you know, you get your hashtags right and get your social media right and ask people a lot younger than me about how to make that work. Then, you know, you can do consultation in a much more visible way than you could 15 or 20 years ago. I mean, to do this, don't we need really strong leadership? What if Birmingham just doesn't have the leadership to inspire communities to create this vision for the Games? It'd be great to have the leadership uh, in City Hall and in the Town Hall. And, you know, I think you should push to say this would be good and we should do it. If that can't happen, then we've got to find leadership in schools in faith, in communities where people can say, well, we're starting it now anyway, and hopefully the people in power will join in, or if they don't join in, we'll do it and they'll listen. It's much better for all the reasons I've said about the capacity for the reach for it to, for it to be owned. But actually, you know, there are lots and lots of people, you know, the different MPs from the city can help to make it happen in their place, uh, you know, and they can do that, you know, collaboratively rather than trying to just own it. You know, councillors can do it, but civic leaders can do it. So I think, I think there's lots of leadership in this city, but I'd like, it, I'd like it to be led, I suppose, by 18-year-olds by in Birmingham and in the town hall and to be sort of equally owned, actually, in terms of, because it's, it's from below, but it needs some capacity from above. And you've mentioned the Games. Isn't there a risk, if you're focusing such a study just to be about Commonwealth Games, that afterwards it all just gets forgotten yeah. uh, and we get left behind? Yes, again? and that's why I'd like to use the three years beforehand, say we're bringing about change, but it won't, the story, the job won't be finished. We've glimpsed the story we want to tell, but we've got five, ten years more work to do it. But there are other moments as well. A, a moment I would really like to see to use to bridge in Birmingham is remembrance every November, this November special, because it's 100 years, um, you know, it's 100 years of the centenary of the armistice of the First World War. Well, the, the armies that fought um, a century ago look much more like the Britain of 2018 and the Birmingham of 2018 than they look like the Birmingham of 19. 18, but the way we do remember hasn't reflected that, and yet that is just emerging now in this centenary. And so we could get that right as a projection this year, 100 years, and say we're going to do that every year. It will get more diverse because it will reflect not just the sissy we are now, but it will actually reflect the true history, actually, of this was about all of us. We have much more shared history, shared identity than we think, but we've got to spend time on it. So I think there are lots of other big moments, and maybe this conversation could throw up what some of them are. You've mentioned also like a, a single kind of overarching vision, especially for the games, to project uh, our city. But what's wrong with multiple visions and different uh, ideas and feelings about the city? Let, let a thousand flowers bloom. And I think because you've got social media, because you've got the media, I mean, we'll let, let's hear a million voices or as many of them as want to turn up. But there will be two hours when lots of people across the Commonwealth and across the country watch somebody tell a story about the, the, the region the city and the fact of does does the city itself feels that's our story i had a voice in that i was part of that not just the volunteers who are there on the day but if, if people feel that they've owned it then i think i think there's more chance of sustaining the buzz into things you'll use for five or ten years <coughs> rather than just feeling it was nice that it was that, that it was birmingham that got to host the party that year thank you sender And so for the last time this evening, over to you. I can see a hand that's been up for a while already. I'd like to draw together two um, strands that I've heard. One is the question of identity. What is our identity? And the second strand is the matter of human capital that ties so much together. Um, I want to remind everybody 
who should know, everybody should know this, the identity of Birmingham is very strongly non-conformist and tolerant. Um, at a time when there was terrible religious persecution in this country, the um, person who owned the land in Burm um, was open to tolerance and the people basically went to America or they came to Birmingham. And amongst the people who came to Birmingham were Priestley and Watt and uh, the great the Bolton, Matthew Bolton. And we had something called the Industrial Revolution. And now, if we're looking at drawing in capital from elsewhere, I just think that's a crazy idea. What we need is human capital here. And I'm very grateful the idea of human capital came. Education, of course, is the basis. We are very fortunate. Um, we have a tremendous uh, birth rate in this city. So we are a growing city. This city will be 2 million population rather than 1.15 million population within 40 years. It's a booming population. The opportunities are huge. And building on our past identity of tolerance and openness, and we have accepted lots of migrants and done it quite effectively most of the time, uh, that openness with the energy, with the youth, and we must remember that 18-year-olds don't know what's impossible. They are the greatest resource that we have. M at my age, I know what's impossible, and it's too much. So let's encourage those young people coming. Let's encourage newcomers. Let's be totally open and accepting and give every opportunity possible because that is the future of a great city and that city could be Birmingham. It was in the past. Let's do it again. What, what, what I loved about that with the non-conformism and the tolerance is you can find there are lots of hidden stories, forgotten stories, stories some people know and nobody will know, and suddenly there's one that was forgotten and it couldn't be more relevant right now to tell that story again to people who've never heard it. So you can do that. So there are lots of stories um, you can tell, but, you know, Europe's younger city expects to invent the future again. It invented the future in the past, but it's not just going to look back at that. It could invent the future again. There are lots of different stories that people might bring up and tell, but I think there could be a confidence here, and maybe this is a city that has felt overlooked. Uh, you know, Manchester sort of, you know, bangs on a lot about what it's up to. You know, London doesn't know that anywhere else exists. And, that, you know, that having the confidence to say, actually, we've got a confidence about our future, not just a nostalgia about our past, is really, you know, an important place for this city to, to get to. Hiya. Um, in terms of what you're saying about discussions and stuff needing to happen, I completely agree. However... My kind of world in Birmingham, those things are happening. You know, there is a lack of opportunities here. And because of that, people have started making their own opportunities. And there's so much going on here. And I feel like it's almost overlooked. There's so many um, companies that are already talking about everything you've just said, but they're being ignored. Not within the people that they've got involved, because obviously they are progressing and they're doing amazing things, but within what you're saying, it almost seems like you've not heard of them or you don't know about them. So is there something you can be doing or people in positions of power can be doing to find those um, groups and organisations and support them? Because they're literally doing it by themselves and they're doing an amazing job, but they're not being able to really, you know, get to everyone across Birmingham. Um, but it's happening, it's there. Could you give an example or two of those then? So, Beat Freaks, I don't know if people have heard of Beat Freaks. And they were invited to this, yeah. Yeah, um, so amazing. Andy Street set up the WM Generation campaign. Had, we had social media, was blasting with amazing stories, success stories from Birmingham. Um, I've got a lot of creative friends that have set up their own vid videographer companies, photographer companies. Um, you know, there's fame through social media now. There's a few people from Birmingham that have absolutely shot up and again on their own back because because of our lack of opportunities. It's almost beautiful because it's given us this tenacity. And as the um, gentleman said there, the younger people, you know, they've got an optimism, an optimism that we kind of lose as we get older, I think. And they're doing it now. And if we keep ignoring it, they might stop. Uh, I think that's a 
really well-made observation. I mean, this West Midlands Leadership Commission, which Andy Street has set up, is full of people with those stories, and you know that that you know that 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 could really do with that spotlight. Again, I'm there as a like the founder of Beat Freaks is on. Yeah, it, yeah, it? Beat Freaks is, are there. Um, you know, I'm again, I'm there as the sort of outside imposter voice, just to bring a different uh, perspective. But it's really, it's really important. It really makes a difference when conveners do that, and it's the that is the story, I think, of a very young stage. I mean, that that whole project is about the fact that the leadership in business in public service in politics of the region does not look at all like the population of the region and yet you feel it's there and it could be bubbling under. I mean, another example of what you're saying needs to happen and I think the Commonwealth Games could do it. I mean, in terms of the Royal Wedding, which is a very interesting moment and I think people thought it was good. It was used in a very soft and subtle way, not just to you know, have a black British pres presence very clearly for the first time at a major event, but actually just in terms of who they invited. They invited lots of local projects that were doing good things on the ground in communities. So there were people just on the six o'clock news and on the 10 o'clock news getting their moment because they'd had an invite. So it's just, there, are, there is a chance sometimes in the major event, not just to blast out a kind of thing for the media, but actually to shine a spotlight on people who've done 10, 15 years of work and never got recognition. So it's about time someone recognised you. So that, that's in a way my thought about how, how, you know, it's already true, but people don't know about it. Can you use a big moment to shine a spotlight? And can I just add one more thing really quickly? It's, sorry, in terms of the Commonwealth Games, which is obviously really exciting for the city, um, and using that to form an identity, I feel like the Commonwealth, how it started, the history of it, is never spoken about here. And that, you know, is a massive part of a lot of our identities. At school, I was never taught about the Commonwealth, what it means, we all celebrate it, but actually, it didn't start as a great thing, if we're honest, and we were celebrating it. So how can we be true about our identity and that's, if we're not you know, having the real conversation about it? That's the city it? and the country. Oh, you know, my parents came to this country from, you know, India and Ireland. So that's a very British kind of story. And, you know, it's not, it's not an entirely happy history, but we wouldn't be the country and the city we are today without those things. I mean, with, the, with what's happened with the Windrush generation, Again, we sort of forgot our history and we re-remember our history and it's so important to remember it. I don't know the answer to this, but how many children in, a cl in the classrooms of Birmingham have got a connection to the Commonwealth? I mean, how many haven't? And so the story of the Commonwealth, which is, oh, is it, is it still relevant? Is it too old? Is it just hanging on to empire? The story of Birmingham is in the 11-year-olds the in Birmingham and why they're in that classroom. So there's a real chance, I think, to, to knit together some stories because of the moment that people haven't thought of. But really, having a discussion about which of those stories are the most important. And, you know, there will be literally a million different views. And how do you fashion that together? And one final question we have time for. The lady just at the, in the blue. I, just to pick up on that final point, one of the things that Birmingham said when they went for the Commonwealth Games was that they reckoned there was somebody from every single Commonwealth country living in this city. I don't know whether it's true, whether it goes, but that's what they said. But what I would say, listening to you, I, I live in Hansworth in Birmingham, and I've lived there since 1979. And just in the last year, we have had everybody beating a path to our door in Hansworth, doing exactly the same sort of consultation uh, as you've suggested. I was at another one yes, last week. We have focus groups, we have big, clever <laughs> posters written up on the wall. Uh, we have people sitting outside the co-op co consulting. They're all different. They've all got different funding. Some of us are getting absolutely <laughs> sick of being <laughs> consulted and being, it being assumed that we will become some how part of the answer, because most of us volunteer up to there already. But the things that will come out is litter, parking, crime, people being put in the area against their will. And Hansworth wants to celebrate, this is what comes out very strongly, it's a multicultural community. The people who live there because they want to live there, they live there because they enjoy living in a multicultural community and they want that to be celebrated. And they're worried that the cultures are being driven apart. Yeah. Um, and that is one of the saddest things that I, I brought up our kids in that area they went to the local school because we thought they ought to grow up in the world that they were going to live in. And that is what the world is like. Um, but just, just as a, another, another it'll have, it'll point, quick. I, can I just say one more thing? I've come here today from volunteering at Birchfield Harriers where I actually do their archives because nobody else will do them. They go back to 1877. Actually, they started in Hansworth because it wasn't part of Birmingham at the time, but they're a Birmingham-based club. This weekend... 
they're running the European Clubs Championships. Birchfield has managed to get through. The men's team is in that championships. Your local club is running against lots of... I've been labelling boxes for countries... Uh, if you want to go and watch your local team at the stadium that will hold the Commonwealth Games, go to Birchfield this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, and enjoy some good athletics. And that's okay. a nice note to end that on. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Sunday. So we've had a, had a wide-ranging debate, it seems, and hopefully this is just a start of many conversations seeded throughout the city, perhaps part of a big, brummy conversation, who knows. Um, through that, we hope to be able to challenge ideas, come together, and also, perhaps in some small way, go about building a better Birmingham one step at a time. Um, as I promised at the beginning, I would just like to st still see a straw poll, a kind of hand poll, about what people think they've heard so far today and if their views have changed from the begin their early assumptions to where we're at at the moment. So we've heard proposals on education uh, and its links to integration and employment. We've heard about planning and placemaking. We've heard about opportunities for young people. And we've also heard a story about the way in which identity can be manufactured and presented and reflective for um, a city going forward. Just as a show of hands, I remember we've got some notes from, from the first time round. Who thinks that of those four issues, education and its links to integration and employment is the one that most needs to be addressed? Okay. Who thinks it's planning and placemaking? Okay, so, so. Who thinks about its opportunities for young people and for young women? Okay. And who thinks it's about the formation of Birmingham's identity, as we've just heard now? Okay, so I think that that's, do you think it's education just squeezing planning, or perhaps? <laughs> but perhaps a tie, perhaps a tie. Does perhaps that, mean a, come back next that means you, but, uh, uh, to, have a rematch. To, yeah, it's a, it's a playoff between uh, placemaking and education. But that's not, particular, that's not really the point. I think that, I mean, we've heard pr problems and proposals, optimism and anger, but I think together, public debate matters. This is important to do. It is important for Birmingham's future to be able to work out what it is that we want to do as a city and how we might go about doing that. And I'd just like to thank you all for coming and remind you that we have refreshments outside and a lot, number of different civic groups that are doing things in the city um, that would like to speak to you and show you what they're doing. So you're all more than welcome. Thank you. <laughs>